Hello and welcome to another one of my uh, sessions called In Conversation With. Uh, it's been a while since the last one, but today I have a very interesting guest, a new author called Maureen Sullivan, who's written a fantastic new book called The Girl in the Tunnel from Merion Press, which is published here in Ireland. And uh, it's quite a shocking story, uh, which will uh, enthrall anybody that reads it and unfortunately also appall people because it's it's not really a happy story. It is a, a story of somebody coming through terrible uh, ordeals and coming out the other side, but the fact that she had to go through uh, this terrible ordeal in the first place is something that I'd hope uh, we'll never see again in the future. So uh, welcome, Maureen, and it's great to have you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. So um, we'll start. Um, can you tell me how you came about uh, writing this book? Well, I think uh, the reason why I went about uh, writing the book was was the way that I was treated. I was treated completely different to any other Magdalene because most of the Magdalenes that was in my group were a lot of them was maybe fancy and boys or uh, maybe ran away from home or, you know, something like that, or maybe had a child and gave the child up and they were afraid she'd get pregnant again and she was put into a magdalen, or maybe some girls reckoned that they were put in because they were good looking. Um, there was all different reasons. But my reason was that uh, I was abused by my stepfather in my home. And I told a nun here in Carlo. And for some reason, they don't want that coming out. They didn't want it come because I shouldn't have been in a magdalen laundry at the age of 12. And that's why they used to hide me in the tunnel. Um, they always kind of put my story kind of in the background. They never brought it out front. Um, they didn't even give me proper justice. I was only compensated for one laundry in New Ross, which I was two years there. And then I was trafficked after that to different places, two other different places. They denied for a long time that I was in the places, but at long last, I got my papers to prove that I was there. So I just was so determined that my story wasn't going to die. They were not going to put me in the background and just didn't want to hear about my story. Didn't like when uh, newspapers or anything published anything about me. Uh, the groups even tried to drown me. Um, so I just said to myself one day I'm not going to let my story die that if I can save maybe one or two children in the future that to me that is worth doing my book and I think the world should know about what happened I was an innocent child and none in my school uh, recognised that I was very unhappy I wasn't communicating or anything with other children now, that nun was very good to me and always looked after me. And so I, she got around me by some chocolate sweets and I told her the story. And it was a priest that decided that I should be sent down to New Ross. I was supposed to go to St. Aidan's to get educated. But when I got down there, it was a completely different story. And at long last, after years and years and years, the truth came out. They didn't want me playing with the other children in case that I told the other children my story of what happened to me in the home. And we only found this out a few years ago when one of the Good Shepherd nuns met up with us and apologised. But she wouldn't apologise publicly. She said she'd do it in private, and which she did. And she told the true story about what happened to me how my education was taken from me. That's the reason why my education was taken from me, because they couldn't have me talking to the other children. 
Oh, that's shocking. Now, can it I is shocking, and I don't think it should ever happen again. And I just and I decided not to let my story die. That I was going to get it out there because I'm seventy now, and I mean, when you come to seventy years of age, you don't know in your life how long you have lived. So that's the one thing I want to do is leave this behind, my story behind, that it can help other people and that people knows what happened in this country. I think my opinion on all the church had too much power here. And I think the government was very too much beside them, very much with them. The two of them were of the one. And I think that's where the big mistakes was made here. Mm, I'd agree. Well, fair play to you for for doing this and having the 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 bravery and the resilience to just keep on going through all this time. Now, for some of the people listening, they will not know what the Magdalene laundries are. I think nearly everybody living in Ireland knows the, what the Magdalene laundries are, but yeah. people abroad they may not really understand. Um, so um, can you briefly explain to me what what it was and what people, uh, young girls and women, had to do there? Yeah. Well, look, they will say that it was a place, I think the old words they used to use for it, it was a place of penance. It was a place that where we weren't wanted and that they were doing a very good turn by putting us up and taking care of us, which is totally untrue. It was a workhouse, a slave house. Mm. Uh, you uh, got up very early in the morning, say about half six, maybe half six. I never seen a clock from the day I went there. I never seen a clock. I never knew what time it was during the day. Um, so we got up very early in the morning. We'd scrub a corridor. Maybe some, some mornings polish it. Some mornings I do the scrub and some mornings another woman would do something different. Then we would come up, we'd go to mass and then we'd come back and have our breakfast. And then we would go and work in the in the laundry, uh, washing sheets. Now, I never done that. That was down the washroom. I was on the, a thing you call the calendar and I was feeding sheets into the calendar all day long. You'd stop at one o'clock, maybe half twelve, one o'clock for your dinner then you go back to work you finish at five and after your tea in the evening you would do what they what the nuns called was recreation it wasn't recreation it was making rosary beads and knitting iron sweaters for big orders that they had in from different religious places all over the world that have different orders for their rosary beads and there was a lot of orders from America for arm sweaters. So we never stopped working. So I always call it, it was an industry where they made a load of money. They were getting paid from the government as well to take care of us and keep us. But the nuns will try and tell you that we were earning our keep. Totally untrue. There was lots of money being made there. And we were slaves. And I was a child slave. I shouldn't have. And any time that anybody came there that was doing, maybe came in to visit the laundry, I'm not sure who they were. I can't say to this day. But all as I know is the nuns would grab a hold of me and they would hide me in the tunnel until these men were gone. So I don't know if there were inspectors. I don't know if there were business people in to see what how much work we could do or, or I'm not sure but I would be hidden and anyone important came there I was always hidden in the tunnel because I was underage and that I shouldn't have been there but I was made suffer and I was made so how will I put it uh, I had to pay the price for my stepfather's sins yeah, I was the one that was made to suffer for it. But uh, that's the only way I can explain that, that horrible place. It was work, work, work. Women treated like, we, we were treated like dirt. We could not even speak to each other. So we found it very difficult when we came out into the world to communicate 
and it was very difficult for us to communicate. We weren't allowed to talk. Our names was changed. My name was changed to Francis. I mean, how cruel is that? Not only did it take the only love that or care that I had in Carlo, where I came from, was my grandmother. That took them years away from her. That took them years away from me. That took my education and that took my identity. My name was changed to Francis. That's appalling. I mean, people isn't it? People are aware of. Um... Say, for instance, um, in Thailand, they have children shelling prawns that live in cages. But people don't think of such things as this in modern European countries. But um, am I right in thinking they didn't even close these Magdalene laundries down till some like, sure, it was, uh, I think it was the beginning of this, this new century. So yeah, no, I think still going for. Yeah. So the uh, not far off the the end of the millennium, it's yeah. absolutely appalling. And you're absolutely right. I mean, it was slavery. In your case, you were you were a child. You weren't even old enough to be officially in that place. Yet they put you in there. And the yeah. older girls, what uh, would it have been? Fifteen, sixteen would be the youngest, would it? No, I'd say they're even older than that. Even I'd say. Older. Yeah, I'd say the lo a lot of them were the younger ones, I'd say it was in their 20s. And then there was very old women, mm. very, very old to be a lot of grey haired women, uh, very downtrodden, no life in these people, uh, no smile on their face. It, it was the saddest place and it was the most horrendous place to I it's terrible memories and you will get triggers back there. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that will trigger you and you go back to them places and it's an awful memory. It stays with you for the rest of your life. Of I mean a child should have a good memory of their childhood. And you, you, even now I look at my little granddaughter and I think, my gosh, if anything ever happened to her like that and how could anybody hurt children? But I have to say this, Luke, Ireland is not a place to talk about child abuse. Mm. Yeah. They don't like it. They like to cover it up. And especially if it's in family, you you suffer for the rest of your life and you suffer till the day you die. <laughs> it stays with you. You have the pain then of the family that is upset. They want it hidden. And the church was very good at covering it up and hiding it for them. Yeah. I mean, it's bad enough that you were abused by your stepfather. Yeah. But rather than arresting him, uh, Correct. he punished you instead. I mean, I, yeah. even now, even in this modern Ireland, you're right that there is still the stigma that families will try and conceal it. Uh, and sweep it under the carpet because they're too embarrassed Whereas really what should come first is the protection and the interests of the child. First, yes. first and yeah. always should always be the case. But, you know, the, the government here it, it has been complicit with all this. What the church has done, as you said, making money, enslaving women especially, and the, all the abuse that's gone on over decades and decades, you know, the scandals with the priest, uh, things like transfition. Uh, transphysiotomy, I think it's called, these horrible operations they did on women. All these yeah. things, it's just, it just appalls me that an organisation that is supposed to act in the name of Jesus and in the name of God can behave in such an unholy and actually downright evil way towards people. Uh, and your story is I'd say it's not actually surprising. It's shocking. It's appalling. But given the history of what's gone on, I'm not really that surprised to hear this because the history of the church in Ireland in the last hundred years seems to be one of uh, wide scale abuse of, uh, of people and making money out of people suffering uh, like yourself. Yeah, you yeah. Were, were literally a slave. Uh, for the Catholic Church. 
correct, yes. And and I tell you the the thing that kind of shocked me a lot about we have an old video, but we can't use it um until the nuns have passed. Um I have a nun telling me when I went to see her, and uh, because it really started to bother me as I got older, of how could have been so cruel to take my education from me. I, I can't, for, for the life of me, understand that. Why would they be so cruel and just use me as a slave? Uh, a child that came to them in desperation, I should have got, um, so a child like that should be nourished and cared for and loved and treasured. But it was completely the opposite what happened to me. And then when the truth did come out, I call it when the veil was lifted, they still wanted to hide it. And that nun that day, when she told me my story, I knew they had all my files on me because my boss came with me as a witness, Arnie Stevenson. And he was shocked. I didn't even tell him about the abuse. He didn't know. But the nun was able to fill him in on all my story. Now, this is a nun that said there was no records on me, that they only had me being entered in there, a little small piece of paper, and said that I was a troublesome child. Well, yes, I would think so I'd be a troublesome child if I was being abused. And when I, she said she was sorry, it should never have happened that it was wrong. I wrote a letter to her, and I have the letters, and I asked her, would she please come out and tell the truth about my story and give me some peace in life? And she said, I can't do that. We have to protect, she said, our organisation. She said, but I am sorry, it should never have happened. Your education should be given it to. And another thing, Luke, this is very important. They always denied in the beginning that I was there. They did not want to know me. They wanted me to go away. I, there was even a time when I was afraid that I was going to be murdered or something because they did not need me coming out with this story that I was underage and I was in this Magdalene laundry. So it's... It, it was so disturbing at the time that I thought, are they going to, to kill me or something? Because they tried to hide my story. Do you know how they owned up that I was there? I made my confirmation there. And that's how they had to own up to it. I would have never left Carlo to go down to New Ross to make my confirmation. There was no transport. As yeah, and then the, the address would have been in the church, you see. That it was the Good Shepherd Convent in Uras. So that's how they owned up and told the truth in the end that uh, I was there. Only for that, they would have gone to deny it. If I hadn't made my confirmation in Uras, they would be not denying it to this day. So Maureen, let me ask you, have you to this day had an official apology either from the Catholic Church or from the Irish government? We did have an apology from the Irish government. Uh, Enda Kenny gave an apology. It was a very good apology. I mean, I accept an apology. I think it's a good thing that people say, sorry, we done wrong. And I, I accepted it and I appreciated it. But we never got an apology from the nuns. I asked that nun, would she come public and give me that apology and tell my story and be honest with me, give me some peace. And she was, she refused. I have her letter. And what about the, uh, you know, the actual official hierarchy, the, the bishops, the archbishops, the cardinals? I mean... I'm sure even back in Rome, they must have known about the existence of these laundries and all the funds that it was generating for for the church. 
Yeah. Of course they did, Luke, yes. Of course they did, because they were getting some money out of it as well. I'd say there was a lot of money sent to Rome. They all knew it. The people on the outside, over them grave walls, they knew that there was something wrong going on in there. I mean, let's think about it, really think strongly about it. All these places had big, high grey walls. All the industrial schools, Artane, Letterfrack, all these places was well hidden. And why were they hidden? Why did you have to have such big walls up around a building? If they were doing nothing wrong, why would you have to hide yourself away like that? Mm, absolutely. There, people knew, people knew that there was wrong things going on. It's just people were so afraid of the church. They were so controlled by the church. They didn't want to say anything. Yeah. I think there's been a, a climate of fear surrounding this for a very long time. And, you know, I think it's amazing that you've come forward and you've written this book. It's brilliant because... It, I think more and more we're seeing in society a realisation that there's corruption at all levels, all the way down from the highest points, down the whole structure of society. It's in government, it's in all kinds of organisations, it's in, in it religious organisations. And, you know, the more people that are whistleblowers like yourself, I think the more people will realise that these people don't deserve any respect because they've just abused their positions. And that yes. people's stories, your story and other people like you, that it needs to be heard. The people, the public need to know the truth about what these organisations have been doing and the people that run them as well. Correct. Uh, you're right, Luke, yeah. And, you know... Another thing, I was just watching something on television there a few months ago. Uh, I think it was where two guys in, in, it was either Limerick or Cork, and they were being abused by family members. And there was a, a lady, an aunt of theirs outside, I think she was an auntie, and she said it's been so difficult for them, especially when it's in family. If you speak out in Ireland about child abuse and it's a family member, that's the hardest road you have to go down. It's a very, very tough road because your character will be assassinated. It will be destroyed. I mean, I have had things said about me that I pulled off a nun's veil, but the only mistake that was made was they should never have told that lie because if in the, say, the late 60s, late, sorry, late 50s, early 60s, if you done that to a nun, that would have been documented. And that was an industrial school offence. It wouldn't have been a Magdalene Laundry offence. I was sent to a Magdalene Laundry because I was an abused child. They looked at me as the, the wrong person. I was abused. This should never have happened. It's her fault. Um, my stepfather was a good man. He took my mother on as a young widow with three children. And we were not a part of the family unit anymore. So anything could have happened to me. Just dump her into a Magdalene laundry. Nothing will be said about it. Nobody's going to ask any questions and leave her there. I'm, I'm lucky that I can talk about my story today. I'm lucky that I came out. What if I got sick there and I had died? Nobody would ever know my story. Yeah. And they're still trying to dampen me down and not tell my story. You wouldn't, you, you, I couldn't go into how hard and how difficult that this has been. It's been the hardest journey yeah. of doing this book that I've ever went through. But I am, I was so determined that I'm getting this book out and I'm leaving this, this legacy behind me. That this is what happened to me. I'm not leaving this planet until my story is out there. And now my day has come. Well, thank goodness that you've done that. It's a very brave and yeah. courageous thing to do. But I think, yeah, I, I realise it must have been really hard to write that book uh, after what you've been through. I, can, I can't I can even imagine it's mind-blowing what you must have had to live through. 
Yeah, so, thank you. And I don't think it's over with yet, Luke, to be honest. As I'd say when the book comes out now, I'd say I'm going to suffer again. But look at I'm strong. I'm in a good place. I intend to keep myself well. And I'm I'm going to live out. I hope I can live out the rest of the years that I have. I don't know how many years that is. Nobody knows. Nobody can tell. I'm going to try and live it in a bit of peace and happiness. And I'm not after no money from my book. I want to help Bernardos, which I've already signed up with them, to help children that is going through this abuse. Uh, and I'm I'm pleased about that, that I'll be able to do that for, I hope, a few years to come, that I'll be able to help to help other children. That's fantastic. And talking about the children, I, I don't watch a lot of television, but I saw a panel programme I think it was Tonight Show or something like that. And they were discussing about how children were being let down in this country. This was only a month or two ago that I saw this program. I think a month ago, they were saying how child services were inadequate, that mental health services were, were totally inadequate, that uh, provision for people in care yes. was appalling and unacceptable. And there was um, there was a report about this going back years and years before Leo Varadkar was first uh, Taoiseach. And, of course, he's Taoiseach again now. But he'd seen all this, apparently. he This was made known to him and other people, to me, who Martin and previous Taoiseachs. And yet they've just done nothing about it. And I think it's only, only now they're being publicly embarrassed that not enough is being done to help children. So... Yeah. I think this book is actually fantastic in its timing because you have this scandal about the lack of provision and help for, for young people. And here's you, as you say, you're now 70. And this is just highlighting that this is a problem that has been around for so long. And that yeah. the Irish government has chosen to turn a blind eye to it. For OK, sorry about the interruption there. The uh, computer crashed and we had to restart the meeting, which is uh, very unfortunate. But here we are. We're back again with, with Maureen Sullivan. So, um, as I was saying, um, you've, um, you've come forward with this story, which is um, quite shocking and is still relevant to the times we're in because there's still children suffering. And um, would you say you're hoping that this will help change things for, for people who are in your situation uh, still today, whether enslaved or suffering or being abused? Yes, I do. Um, I hope that it can help people to come forward uh, and uh, speak about these stories. Look, you wouldn't believe the people in Carlo alone that has approached me of their families and how they suffer and their children has been abused and how they're afraid to talk about it. I mean, people have approached me that my stepfather has abused children and now they're grown women and they're too ashamed to even come forward to this day. And to me, that is so sad that we've made no progress on this. Why is it always that it has to be hidden, that it has to be covered up? And governments helping to cover it up and religious orders, they were covering up this big time. They were the, the ones behind all the cover up. So, I mean, that's sad. And I hope that that can stop and that that does not happen again. Yeah, I really hope you're right about this and it doesn't happen yeah. again in the future. So anyway, you've been very brave to come forward and to write this book and to see it through to completion. So fair play to you. And can I ask you, Thank you. When, when is the book actually going to be published? The book is already published. It will be out in all the shops on the 1st of April. 1st of April. Okay. And yeah. is there some kind of website where people can get it? Can they get it from um, the publisher's website or from, Amazon or places yes, like can. that? 
yeah, they can get it from the publisher's website and they can get it'll be in all the shops from the first of April. Okay, so that's Marion Press, their own website, and it'll be on all the usual things like Amazon and Book Depository. Yes. And yeah. Um, yeah. probably in Ireland it'll be in Easons and bookshops like that too, would it? Sure. Yes, it will. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm I'm hoping that they're going to release this all over the world in the states and places like that as well. Yes, I think they are. I'll know more now next week. I will be mm. talking to a, a lady now on Monday, and I will know a lot more about it. As far as I know, it's going to be all over the world. That's fantastic. That's great to hear that. And thank you so much for coming on and sharing your story. And thank I really, you. I really hope this book takes off and becomes a bestseller because. Uh, as you say, um, we don't want to see anybody going through what you've had to go through in the future. And, you know, if if what you've written will save other children from this experience or enable people to come forward and share their own experiences, then then that would be fantastic. Wonderful. Yes, okay. it would be wonderful. Thank you very much. Yeah, Maureen. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.